Hello and welcome everyone to the Graduate Engineer uh, webinar on the topic of a career in energy engineering. It's an absolute delight and pleasure to have you all uh, here this evening. Um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you very much for being here. Just a reminder that today's webinar is recorded, um, so please don't forget to mute your microphone. And uh, yeah, I'd be very happy if you were to contribute in the comments section and uh, in, the com in the questions and answers uh, section. I can definitely bring up some of the questions on your behalf. Um, uh, so without further ado, I just want to flag some of the offerings that are out there and available for our graduate student members. Or Sorry, first to flag that this is part of a long running series where we're exploring different topics for our graduate students and our early career members, uh, looking at topics as varied as innovation to um, undertaking a PhD to uh, how to get involved with the Young Engineer Society. Uh, so we're looking at many different uh, elements over the duration of the series and uh, this is uh, one part of the long running series. Um, so yeah, just to flag that all graduating students this year, you are eligible for a free transfer to full membership. Um, what uh, this means is that instead of having to pay full membership rates, you can get your membership for free this year. And for I guess for the next four years, you'll be taking advantage of a 700 euro discount. So I wanted to plug the graduate student uh, discount rate uh, as we begin. And um, it's very simple to do. You can do it on your mobile phone. Um, I've kind of pulled up a little screenshot of how it would look on your mobile phone. And all you need to do is just click on the become a full member button and you'll be able to become a full member. Um, I guess I guess without further ado, I'd like to get into the kind of meat of tonight's uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to introduce both uh, both our speakers and uh, now, and um, to, I guess I'll start with uh, Patrick Allen. So Patrick is the head of portfolio and risk for Brookfield Renewable UK and Ireland Assets, responsible for maximising revenues for existing assets and the development of new assets through commercial contract negotiations. He joined Brookfield Renewable in 2014 through Brookfield's acquisition of Board Gash Energy's onshore wind assets, Brookfield's first renew renewable acquisition in Europe. Patrick worked to establish Brookfield's European renewable platform, notably in setting up its trades, risks and analytics functions. That's just a short snippet of uh, his career today, but just to flag that he was a Chartered Engineer of the Year finalist in 2020. After Patrick's presentation now, um, in response, uh, we're going to have Marguerite Sayers uh, speaking, who is our immediate past president of Engineers Ireland. Marguerite was, uh, was appointed Executive Director, Customer Solutions of ESB in May 2018. And prior to this, she held the role of Managing Director of ESB Networks Limited. An electric engineer by profession, she has worked in various technical and managerial positions in ESB, including Customer Service Manager and Head of Asset Management in ESB Networks. She was also Generation Manager in Generations and Wholesale Markets. Marguerite has a degree in electrical engineering from UCC, a diploma in accounting and finance from the University of Limerick, and a diploma in project management from UCC. Uh, so I guess without further ado, I uh, hand it over to Patrick to begin this evening's presentation. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Gail. I, I can share my screen here as well. Never oh yeah, sorry, I need to I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll allow you to share your screen. Yeah, so hopefully you can see that there now, guys. Yeah, so I just put together a few slides on this, and uh, thanks to Michal and uh, Engineers Ireland for, for sorting this out. I'm very happy to give you details of how I progress my career in energy and give you a guide on, on how to do that. So uh, thanks to Michal and uh, Engineers Ireland for that. I'm very happy that I'm, I'm just speaking ahead of uh, Marguerite because I saw her lecture on uh, on that, that she gave at Queen's Air recently, so uh, she's a tough act to follow, so I'm, I'm glad I'm uh, going ahead of her. So just tonight, guys, I just want to talk to you. I just want to say, like, three main things to you. Um, the first thing is why I'm interested in energy. And uh, I suppose when I talk, talk to a lot of people, I'd say energy, you can talk to the farmer in the field about it, or you can talk to a government minister. It impacts everybody, and uh, it has a huge impact on, on our society. <coughs> So I've just shown two kind of graphs there. One on the left-hand side there is uh, the electricity generation um, um, per capita and uh, your GDP growth there from the gapminer.org. So it just shows that where, where energy goes, prosperity follows. So uh, 
electricity generation is, is a real precursor to uh, economic growth and it's really important part of our society. So that's why I'm, I'm very interested in it. The second thing that I just wanted to show to you there was just the impact there for, that COVID has had. So I just got this from the SEI uh, report. So you can see there how our um, electricity demand fell significantly on, on the first lockdown. But uh, thankfully, um, we're seeing signs of recovery there, and that's signs of recovery in, in our overall uh, sector. As I said there, the uh, e electricity and energy is interesting because it impacts all parts of society. It has impacts on a local scale, and it has impacts on a global national scale as well. So I take this example here of Cape Clear. I mean, back in 1987, they deployed two 33 kilowatt wind turbines on the island of Cape Clear. It, it was a real big, prestigious event. Ireland was a totally different world. We were actually in the midst or the end of a financial uh, recession in the end of the 80s. Charles Hockey came down to open it. The cost of the turbines was something like, in today's money, 25 million per megawatt, and it was sponsored by the German government as an, as an R&D project. Um, and the size was 33 kilowatts. You fast forward in 30 years, where are we now? You can now get wind turbines from Siemens Gamesa that are up at 14 uh, megawatts. Uh, the cost of onshore wind is down about 1 million to 1.5 million um, a megawatt. Offshore turbines now can go up to 260 megawatt or 260 meters. And the, the grid intensity of our system has come down significantly. So a lot has changed in the, in the last uh, 30 years and then the thing is now what's going to happen in the next 30 years and I think that's there's been a lot of interesting and exciting targets put out from the climate change Paris climate change to limit our temperatures to 1.5 degrees and I think that creates huge opportunities for engineers uh, who are interested in the, the energy sector. So we talked there about the the macro scale um, or the, the micro scale but what renewables have to do, and renewables have a huge opportunity to scale up. And I was just showing there, like the sense of scale there, in the previous picture there, you could see the, the 16 meter high hub height relative to a house. But this is the, the offshore floating foundation for turbines that are pr projected to go off shore in uh, Portugal. You can see the scale of the foundation. These are just the foundations for these floating turbines. So the scale of renewables has to really become um, massively increased. And I think that gives a huge opportunity to everybody listening here tonight. So I talked about the, the micro scale, the local Cape Clear project. There's also the, the macro scale and the global elements of it. And I was just reading something there about uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and uh, the work that they're doing in Pakistan. So in Pakistan, China is looking to deploy like 62 billion euros worth of capital and 70% of that or the majority of it is, is going into energy projects. So you can see there all the energy projects on, on the right hand side there. They basically want to build out like 10 gigawatts or 10,000 megawatts in the next few years. The majority of that is, is coal infrastructure, but there's also solar, there's also hydro, there's a bit of wind, there's also a massive power line that runs the length of the breadth of the country. So it's a huge uh, capital deployment. And just to give you a sense of scale, like we would have like about 12 gigawatts in that kind of re range in Ireland. So they basically want to build out the R Irish power grid in the next few years. And this is the types of monies that is involved and the challenges. But also a lot of these uh, projects are project financed. And I think it's really important for engineers to ask about the why. Why are we building this thing? Why are we deploying this thing? Because in your undergraduate degrees, you learn about the how, you learn how to physically build things, but it's really important for engineers if they want to have a, a strong voice uh, in society and communities at large to ask about um, the why. The why are, are, are we building this problem? So I just wanted to kind of give it kind of a scale up, a sense of the scale of the opportunity. So like 62 billion, it's very hard to put it put into context like the Irish uh, uh, economy maybe be like 85 to 100 billion in size so it is significant so I wanted to just graph out in Excel what 62 billion like relative to other um, other projects that are, are going on and if we were to hit this uh, the 1.5 degrees as according to the Paris climate change 
um, what 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 is that cut spending going to be? So you can see there on the left hand side, 62 billion. The EU recovery budget post COVID is something in the region of 880 billion. Uh, the majority of that is going to be spent on uh, green initiatives. So that creates a huge opportunity for us. Uh, Joe Biden, president elect in America, has a two trillion uh, climate budget, and it's really interesting to see that he's John Kerry as a special envoy in climate. Um, that should create America being brought back into the Paris Climate Accord. But the, the graph on, or the, the size on the right there just shows if we are to hit that 1.5 degrees in 2050, how much do we have to spend? And we have to spend on renewables around 750 billion per year. I think last year we spent about 195 billion. So there's a huge opportunity and there's, it's really the onus on up is on us as engineers to take that mantle and deploy those assets for the greater good of society. So I think we're really working through that transition now as well. And you can really see it from the amount of money that's going to be spent, where the governments are allocating it, and also in the stock market. And I think this is a real seminal moment here where we can see that next era energy, who I suppose essentially they're a utility they do have other fossil fuel assets in their uh, um, in their base but they're really a, a strong proponent of the renewable growth and exxon mobile one of the biggest oil producers in the world and um exxon mobile is just falling out of the s p 500 for the first time in its history and its market capitalization and next years are becoming comparable so we are really in the midst of this transition as we speak and uh, I saw there was a good article there by Michael Liebrick and he did a nice quote and he said, um, or he, he taken it from an, an Arab minister, I think from the 70s, an oil minister, he said that uh, the Stone Age didn't end because of there was, they ran out of stones. The Stone Age ended because new technologies came on and superseded that. So we're in the midst of that transition. So I think anybody who's interested in energy, you're, you're, you're in a great space at the moment. So that just covers the, the first point my interest in energy and I hopefully uh, everybody listening their interest in it. The second thing I just wanted to give a kind of a rundown of how I navigated my career in, in towards that so it's a bit more factually based. I did my undergraduate degree in UCC in civil engineering. I then, as I say, served an apprenticeship with a great company called Punch Consulting. Uh, some brilliant engineers up there uh, in their Dublin office. But around that time then I started uh, investing myself seeing what I was interested in. I said I wanted to do, see something in energy, so I did a postgraduate diploma in the University of Ulster. As I said, that was just wetting my beak in the industry. Uh, I then did a master's in energy systems, uh, UCC via it's ERI, now called the Mary Centre. And then became a, that gave me the, the kind of way in to become a project manager in SWS. Um, we were then bought out by Borgosh, where I then became a lead analyst managing the combined cycle like gas turbine, the power station in the energy market. And that was really interesting because you were linking the financial elements of the market and the physical elements of the of the power station. So that, I think that, that really played to a lot of my strengths and interests. And in the last six years now, I've really helped grow the Brookfield business as it's uh, established in uh, 2014. So that's just like that constant improvement, constant being interested is something that I'd really highlight to uh, students listening today. Um, then these are just a kind of an array of the projects that I've worked on. Um, there's been a lot of technical stuff like on the substations and the grids um, and, uh, and the power stations. I also put in a small little footbridge there, not that it was anything to do with anything of any merit, but it was just something that I was particularly uh, proud of. I also wanted to get across that if you wanted to really propel your career, you really have to have passion for it. I think uh, if you have passion and interest in it, uh, you don't have to worry about anything else because the, the success and the rewards will follow from that. Um, and, you know, I've looked to involve third levels in, in Cork with the Insight Centre. And I've also looked to set up the same energy community in my, in my hometown as well. So you have to have that kind of passion. We've also done a lot of innovation in terms of analytics, data. I think it's something that we work on day to day and it's really important for you. Uh, you guys listening to be able to manage data and to actually present it and communicate it effectively. Um, you know, the communication of 
uh, key technical points is something that uh, you shouldn't underestimate. And if you have that skill set and you can develop it over time, um, that communication is uh, really important. So just give a further subset of, of where Brookfield has come from and, and where we're going uh, as a business. In 2014, when they, Brookfield came in first, we would be, as they say, um, an invest and forget type model would have been typical, but uh, we've really uh, set up our business to grow into the future. So we have set we did interconnector trading, set up analytics functions. We built and divested uh, several assets. We now trade in, in ISM where it's a market where we manage our positions on a day-to-day. -day. So we are linking the market and the uh, operations guys on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And now we have a, a strong growing customer base. We're involved in different markets like capacity markets, ancillary service markets, energy markets. Um, and all of that is linked to the physical assets as well. Like, you know, you have to be able to build these assets as effectively uh, as possible uh, and run them accordingly. So it, it kind of touches on a lot of interesting subsets and you can go in as deep or as shallow as you want in any of these. So I, I think that's why uh, energy is a really interesting and compelling uh, industry to, to, um, to work in. So that's uh, just the second point that I wanted to cover. Um, so the first point was my interest. The second point was uh, my career trajectory. And then the third point that I just wanted to speak to you tonight, um, and it's the final piece of advice that I will give, is that anybody who wants to work in the energy sector, um, I would compel you to do so with commitment and passion. I think if you can show that commitment and passion, uh, you don't have to, to worry about everything anything else. I've touched on the Paris Climate Accord, showing that by 2050, we'd have to reduce our carbon emissions by 90%. And the spend is something like, as we said, 750 billion per year. That's a huge opportunity for you, for you guys. And it is, it, also to us, it is up to us as engineers to deliver that future for our communities and our society at large. Like, I realise now it's, it's a really tough time for you guys uh, with COVID, uh, with the uncertainty, uh, with the restrictions. But like, I've worked through the, the 2008 recession myself and the thing that got me through that was that I had consistently done things that I was interested in. I was interested in energy and I had done that uh, postgraduate diploma that then uh, created the launch pad for, for my career. So I would encourage you to show your passion for the industry that you're working in or, or that you want to work in. Start to blog, record a podcast, get involved in your communities. Engineers Ireland have some great... Uh, divisions and communities as well um, are very active now in the energy, environment and climate action. And I, I would encourage you all to uh, get involved in those types of elements because the opportunities are there. And as I said, it, this is a kind of a workflow for the next 30 or 40 years. And it's it's not going to be someone like me that's going to deliver that. It's going to be like so we who are listening here today. You are the future of the industry. So I really encourage you to show that passion and get involved and highlight the, the skill sets that are there in, uh, in, uh, in engineering. We started on Cape Clear. There's another little, or there's another engineering feat not too far away from that off the Cork coast called Fastnet Rock. And Fastnet Rock was also known as Ireland's teardrop because it was so many people had to immigrate before. Um, and that was the last thing that they saw of Ireland was this Fastnet Rock that's shaped like a teardrop. So, but I think, with offshore energy, with renewables, and with the skill sets that's been develop, developed in Ireland, we now have the opportunity to avoid those issues and create a really compelling and innovative uh, industry in Ireland in energy. So that's where I conclude that. And uh, if anybody else wants to contact me, there are my contact details. I'd be happy to talk one on one with anyone. So thanks for that, Michal. Thank you so much, and I might at this stage uh, invite uh, Marguerite to make a response. Thanks very much, uh, Michal, and thanks very much, Patrick. Patrick covered an incredible amount in a, in a short presentation and touched on lots of really interesting topics. So I, I'm hoping that we do get a chance maybe to tackle some questions and answers later, because sometimes that's where the 
I, I suppose the real benefit in, in um, a presentation comes when you can actually engage and, and you know any topic that's piqued your interest that you can kind of explore it a little bit further. So thanks Patrick for, for everything you touched on there. Um, I was kind of laughing when you, you, you were kind of uh, suggesting that um, you know it was the, the people on the call who are the future of uh, the industry. Um, and I mean, they definitely are, but I uh, hope you weren't writing yourself off because where I'm coming from, you have youth on your side relative to me now. Um, I'm almost 30 years in the energy industry this year. And I suppose one of the things for me, going back to what Patrick said, it has absolutely flown by, which is a real, I think, symptom of the fact that it is a really, really industri interesting industry in which to work. And, you know, I, I think when Patrick went through, you know, some of the complexities that are there, the various roles that he's had in different companies, and also talking about the different facets of, you know, going from construction to trading, um, looking at renewables, um, you know, needing backup from thermal, etc. There's a huge variety of careers that are available in energy, and you got a small taste of them there. It is, it has become really, really complicated as an industry, but to me, that's almost a synonym for interest. So it is very interesting. There's loads and loads of different parts of the industry that you can get involved in. Um, I think there's there's something there for everybody. And um, we're all aware of the importance of the energy industry and the transition as well for the planet and for making sure that we reduce our carbon footprint. So I, I suppose just um, to let you into a bit of a secret, um, I could get fired out of both uh, ESB and, and Engineers Ireland for this, but um, I actually had no interest whatsoever in uh, energy <laughs> engineering when I finished in, in university. And the cool industry at the time was actually telecoms and digital, and that's really where I wanted to work. But there was a recession um, back in the early 90s, and it really became about where you could get a job. But I also had worked for a summer with ESB, and what I really loved about the energy industry, and I'm sure maybe Patrick might have found something similar, is there's a lovely mix in energy between outdoor work and indoor work, between technical and people relationships. And you don't get that in every single industry. I certainly saw it in, in Patrick's roles there that he mentioned. And I suppose way back then, which is like I said now almost 30 years ago, if you did want to work in the energy industry or if somebody was offering you a job, it tended to be in either uh, Board Gosh Energy, as it was at the time, which encompassed the, the networks part that's now GNI, or in ESB, there were the two. And, and there was about probably something of the order of 17 or 18,000 people working in energy in the whole country. Uh, and now uh, I think the most recent figure in that is up somewhere close to 70,000. So there's a whole variety of careers. There's brilliant opportunities and very, very different types of roles that are available. Uh, and again, looking at the, the transition and what we're going through at the moment, I think Patrick touched on a lot of key areas. So we know we have to transition our energy, as I said, for, for a, you know, to, to reduce our, our carbon emissions and to help with climate change. Energy is where one, particularly in Ireland, because we can't do a huge amount to tackle our agriculture emissions, um, emissions or at least if we do, it would have serious economic and, and cultural consequences. So there's a lot of heavy lifting being done by the energy industry. And that's facilitated by lots of advancements in technology and it's been facilitated by changes in regulation. And it's also being facilitated by lots of new entrants, lots of new companies, lots of new innovation. So there's, again, lots of variety there. Uh, and all of that is leading to us having a very um, different energy industry to what we had even 10 years ago, certainly 20 or 30 years ago. So looking um, just, I suppose, when you, when you read the newspapers, you hear lots of depressing stuff at times, or I feel it's kind of negative and depressing because I think some of what we've achieved as a country has been fantastic. So in the, in the 12 months up to July of this year, Northern Ireland actually had 48% of their energy was generated by renewables. The figure for 2019 in the Republic was 38%. There were times last year, last, in the last month that 75% of our energy requirements in the Republic came from renewables. Uh, and that's actually close to being a world first. So, you know, there's, there's a huge amount that has been achieved. And I think it's really important particularly as engineers, that we talk about the achievements because they're the bedrock for the next group of people, the next advancement, the next achievements. Um, so there, there's also big advancements across electric uh, heating, um, not as much as we would need to see, and that's a big area I think we're going to see in retrofitting, a lot of advancements in that area over the coming years. 
and also in uh, renewable transport. So um, we have new areas for compressed natural gas. We've got um, about 25% of the cars that have been purchased this year have either been hybrids or full electric. You don't get those kind of figures. You only hear about the negative stuff again and range anxiety. Um, so a huge amount going on in the energy transition. And I do think for anybody coming out of college now, and I'm sure all of you that are on the call do have an interest in energy or you wouldn't have joined this call this evening. And I suppose going back to what Patrick said again, and I think, like I said, he covered a huge amount really, really well and quickly, um, you know, that there's a big opportunity maybe for you here as well a little bit this evening to ask questions of both of us and, and uh, we'll certainly hopefully give you the benefit of both, both of our careers in the industry but also um, you know, to use the opportunity after today to talk to people about the jobs. It's not just about the course you're doing, it's not just about the subjects that you're studying, because you can find actually that despite what you're studying, the job that you want to do mightn't be what you thought it was going to be, as was my case. So um, I would encourage you to use Engineers Ireland because there's a whole uh, you know, wealth of experience. There's uh, people working in lots and lots of different industries. And if you do use uh, your membership of Engineers Ireland, it'll give you access to uh, 26,000 members, um, 18,000 of whom uh, are not students who are working in lots and lots of different areas. And you can use those networks to find out about different jobs, different opportunities and different roles. So I'm going to leave it at that um, or I'll be in danger of overtaking um, the question and answer period, which I think is really important. So I'm going to hand back now to you, Michael, unless there's something else that you'd, you'd uh, like me to cover. Um, but I, I think, like I said, that, that Patrick did a fantastic job. So there's probably some questions there in the chat at this stage. Absolutely. The questions have uh, begun to uh, start rolling in and uh, thank you both uh, so much. That was really fantastic. And I'm definitely taking away like the, an air of positivity. Like we just last week, we had a kind of a career insights uh, webinar exploring the graduate jobs market. And uh, yeah, like the, the consensus is that you're kind of graduating into a really um, tough jobs market. And what I always uh, say in doing these things, I know there's a couple of questions queuing in the Q&A, but I definitely want to take advantage and try and grab in uh, one myself to, to both uh, to both of you. And I guess it's just um, like during the webinar, we got a bit of a insight into there's um, kind of like a 90s uh, recession. There was the late noughties recession. Now we're looking at potentially a, an early 20s recession. Um, and I guess for like one of the things I picked up from, from Patrick's presentation is like in those first steps like uh kind of getting yourself out there like having your linkedin posting blogs and everything like making a name for yourself and um, i just want to put out like any other like practical uh strategies for uh young engineers in energy and uh, how they can begin for taking those first steps um to get themselves out there to the jobs market or is there anywhere in particular and it's okay if this is a bit of a vague question so if, if you don't have an answer on that i know it's a tough one so to, to either of you whoever wants to jump in on that one so I, I think, first of all, actually, I, I was remiss that I didn't congratulate um, Patrick in, in being shortlisted for Chartered Engineer of the Year, of the year. I, for people who haven't been through that process. It, 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 they may not realise the extent to, to which that is a fantastic achievement. So well done, Patrick. I should have said that early on. Apologies. Um, I, I think, um, you know, some of what I said about those kind of networks, and it's amazing, you know, even when Patrick was talking there and going through his career, um, I could pick out, I think I, I, I might mention three names to you, Patrick. So Sean Casey, um, mm -hmm. George Martin, and, yeah. um, and also uh, there was a third, John Pollock in Punch. I don't know if you came across those three people. I've worked with all three of those. So it's amazing. Like We have never worked together, but it's amazing in, in the country, the way the networks inter interact. So, you know, even if the person you're talking to doesn't know uh, how to help you directly, they'll certainly know how to put you in, in touch with somebody. So the engineering community is really helpful. Always uh, glad to share their knowledge. So some key things, I suppose, first of all, um, you know, if you're in, interested in a particular area and you haven't had a chance to work in it, maybe volunteer. Volunteer to, to uh, get um, you know, some um, work experience in that area or that company, even if it means working for free, because then at least you've got contacts there to come back to. And if you make a good impression, they'll come back for you. You have the, all the students' uh, interactions. You have the societies uh, and the divisions that Patrick mentioned in Engineers Ireland. Um, you know, use your own, own network. 
because the thing um, that I always found was when I was in any class, all those people had parents and all those parents had jobs. And sometimes you don't think to use very obvious networks that you've got. And then there's the obvious stuff about keeping your social media and particularly your, your um, LinkedIn profile up to date because that has become a key way for people to um, suss out the jobs market. And the last one, I'd stay quiet then, is look at where the upcoming opportunities are. And you, even if it isn't your primary qualification, you might be able to do an after hours qualification or a certificate in something that isn't a growing area. Like for me, certainly energy retrofits is going to be a huge area in Ireland over the next number of years. So if you could do a little bit of a qualification that you'd be well ahead in terms of getting a job. Yeah, no, I, I echo all those uh, sentiments as well. Like, I think if you show that you have a, an interest in, in something, there's there's lots of opportunities for you to uh, to explore those. Um, I think your your undergraduate degree is one element of it. <clears throat> and like when I was in college, I probably didn't have too, too many extracurricular activities because I was just trying to find my way. But if you can show that you've done those extra bits and you you are showing that you're passionate in, in the industry, I think that's uh, a great. Uh, reflection on somebody as well um like there's there's great organizations have said in, in engineers ireland in terms of um the the different divisions and um and i would say like just have kind of confidence in your own um abilities and, and what you've done so far like as marguerite said i was uh, shortlisted for chartered engineer but uh, at the outset i actually think i was kind of almost like too shy to kind of go for it because i was thinking maybe i don't have that story I maybe don't have those capabilities built up but actually when you start writing those things down and you actually start telling that story it can be compelling so i would say people like you know like um like if you you've got a, a great education so far and it's now time to build on that um and that was a kind of mistake that i did in 2008 in that i managed to stay in, in employment um, because i've done my um energy uh, qualifications and things like that um, but I should have really kind of built on it. I actually kind of patted myself on the back and I said, geez, haven't I done a great job here? But I should have really uh, embedded myself more in the community, embedded myself more in societies um, to build up that kind of profile as well. So, um, and like that's something that like I'm cognizant of now as I kind of, my career has progressed and the skill sets now are, are changing. It's more about communication and, and leadership and, and those ones. So you always have to keep evolving and. And if you're doing something that you're interested in, that, that's half the battle, in, in my view. Some excellent insights, and I'm really thankful to you both uh, for some uh, kind of candid answers and analysis of my uh, question. And uh, so I'm going to start going into our, our Q&A has been buzzing, and I'm going to go try and tie the first two together, actually. And so this comes in from Gio and Adam. And... Um, I guess Gio was asking about uh, what kind of companies uh, they might be looking at um, for experience um, in renewable energy, especially in product development. And for Adam, Adam was asking around um, someone in a business account management background to move into the energy industry. Um, uh, what kind of advice for them? As I'll, I'll start before either of you say anything. For Adam, the ESB are always hiring regularly, especially if you just graduated. I know that there's a really good grad program and they, they have, as well as the engineering grad program, there's kind of like a business account stream there, but just one suggestion, but over to our panel. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I just think just on the business accounts thing there is like, I, we're coming from a renewables perspective, especially when we first started off, as I said, with Brookfield, we didn't have any customers associated because we were totally dependent on on refit um which is the subsidy scheme at the time but we've had to evolve our business now and now we have a, a larger growing customer base and i think we'd be one of the largest suppliers in the large energy users market currently so we are finding interactions with customers is a is a key skill set um and renewable energy is something that a lot, a lot of uh, corporates are involved in so uh, i think if you you don't have to be an engineer to to move into that sphere, uh, there is plenty of opportunities. And I, and I think Marguerite touched on some of the points there in terms of the changing energy systems, you know, before electricity was a, a standalone um, industry in itself, but now we have seen the electrification of heat and the electrification of transport. So it's changing different business models. So that should create uh, plenty of opportunities on the, on the business accounts or product development side of things. 
Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, and, and going back, I suppose, to, to what Neil Hall said and, and talking about um, where I know. Um, so we do have a, a graduate program every year where we take people in. And I think it's just um, and a lot of companies do. I'm sure Brookfield does as well. Um, we've just put ads out there again for the, the graduate program for um, the coming year. Um, and um, to, I suppose looking at both, there, there's a whole variety of, of areas in which you can work, uh, including kind of, you know, construction and, and as, as Patrick mentioned, customer service where I work myself. Um, and it's not always the obvious people who have the skill set to, to work with customers, actually. It's, it's a kind of a, a skill set you only know you have when you start trying to use it. Um, but we also have a, an asset development area that is predominantly working on building renewables, which I think was one of the questions there. And, um, you know, right across uh, solar, offshore energy, onshore wind, and then looking at kind of heat pumps, battery installations. There's an awful lot going on in, in that whole area. We also have a, a smart energy services area, which does industrial uh, retrofits and advice. Uh, and other companies replicate those same kind of advantages and, and um, opportunities uh, for graduates as well. So um, there's no end of, of opportunity, I'd say, in, in energy at the moment. Just to go back to that business and commercial question, a really critical area, particularly in asset development, is the ability to have people who can be commercial and who can analyze commercial opportunities. So analysts, commercial analysts, and people with a commercial bent are really important in analyzing the best opportunities right across all the businesses because there are more opportunities there than make sense to exploit so it's about for each company finding the best ones they can so there's most assuredly uh, career opportunities for commercial analysts in all of the renewable companies we certainly have them in esb and it's a bit of a, a short skill set it's a it's um for anybody who does have that skill set and that experience it's very valuable and uh, so uh, you needn't worry at all if you're interested in that area. And also the banks have a huge interest as well in people who have that kind of skill set and experience. Brilliant. Thank you so much again. Um, the Q&A is still, um, still have some questions coming in. So I'll, I'll go on to the next one. Um, it's a really interesting question asking it around uh, kind of diversity, which energy companies support diversity and women in engineering and uh, this uh, this uh, participant um, said, "I find the Irish market very much a uh, male-driven environment." Um, if either, if you want to have a go at that question, yeah, I suppose it's obvious for me to have a go at it. So, um, I I suppose when I graduated, there was twenty percent of of my class um, were female, and that was almost an aberration at the time. A much more typical number is around eight percent, and unfortunately, it hasn't gone up hugely in the last number of years. Um, but again, there are some green shoots. Um, I think I saw Charlie's name on this call earlier, and, and they do huge work in Engineers Ireland, um, trying to encourage girls into into kind of STEM careers. And the numbers have gone up in absolute terms, but not as much in percentage terms. But I think um, there's a, I think it's about 25% of, of this year's or more class in UCD starting off as is uh, female. So it is it is changing. And the problem for um, companies is uh, it's about actually making sure that the feedstock is there in order to select from at interview. So that's one of the challenges. So it does start back at school and then follow on to, to university. Um, but again, um, one of the things we noticed was that um, within ESB, and this was work that some of our, our diversity people uh, did, they, they saw that actually once female uh, candidates got to interview, they had quite a high success rate, but an awful lot of them weren't getting through the particular type of aptitude test that we were using for screening and when they were checked out it discovered they discovered and you wouldn't notice this i didn't notice it but they had a particular bias which actually meant that they were favoring male rather than female and that has changed now so they have changed the the, the entrance exam uh, it's not an entrance exam sorry the, the aptitude test which is a precursor to uh, having an interview and uh, to make sure that it doesn't have that bias anymore so look, it is improving, but it is about making sure that we get more girls interested in STEM subjects, go on to study STEM, and then the industries have got more people to pick from. But just to add, because I've been through 30 years of it, I have not encountered, honestly, hand on heart, one scintilla of discrimination in that 30 years. I have found male colleagues as well as female to be hugely supportive. And, you know, I, I, I don't regret for one minute doing engineering. It's been a brilliant career. Mm. Yeah, I think um, so like it, there's, uh, there's a lot of engineers like uh, Margaret was saying there. It's the it's the feedstock that comes through that if they 
girls aren't studying engineering, then it's hard to get the, the graduates out. I, I suppose I have a particular interest in this now because I've actually a father of three young girls, so they're from eight downwards. So, um, like, a, like I think, yeah, to, to see it, to, to be it. Um, so there's great examples of that in uh, other industries as well. So, uh, hopefully, uh, engineers can um, take up the, the gauntlet on that as well. And um, but it, it is interesting that I suppose we hired an analyst recently and we actually didn't get many female applicants at all and just when Marguerite was saying there maybe it's the way we phrase things or highlight things that we're not kind of hitting those uh, target markets but um, I think that kind of diversity of thought and people bring different ideas to the table from from cultural backgrounds or from gender backgrounds it's something that really is something that we need to make renewables successful um, because like it's not just down to engineers and I think engineers can be very much like the spreadsheet said X so that should be the results you know you have to win in the hearts and minds of people as well uh, communities stakeholders and uh, you need diversity across all the fields uh, gender culture everything um, if we are to hit these uh, uh, targets um, Brilliant, thank you so much. I think two excellent answers again. Um, now there's some questions that are kind of more tailored in towards specific qualifications. So what I might do is take the general CPD one and then uh, circle back to those general ones and pull them together. Um, and I guess as I address uh, Ronan's question, which is um, how difficult is it once in work to balance continuous professional development alongside your work? And as I kind of open this question out, uh, I just want to flag that the STEPS program is a program where you can kind of go and adopt a school um, in early March and uh, encourage um, young school going women to uh, consider a career in engineering. So that could be one great way to build up a CPDR or two, um, just to kind of tie those two together. But yeah, that question, how difficult is it uh, once you're in working and you're in your career to balance your, your 35 hours uh, required every year? Uh, alongside your work so if either you want to I, I can take that one up there because uh i suppose in the presentation there you just have it down as a little bullet point since that I, I i did a master's and yeah it was easily got but i do remember i suppose it was my girlfriend at the time and when i was doing the master's i was kind of coming to the end of it and i was like karina if i ever say i want to do a course again you have to stop me like you know it's just kind of a, a safety word because it, it does take so much time but then i suppose once you've got it done and you've achieved it you kind of the memory fades and you, you might do something again on that like so <laughs> i just want to kind of highlight it that uh, yeah, it is difficult but once you get to it at the end of it and you have that reward and you have that new ecosystem and you've that new skill set it, it's all worth it uh but it, you do have to to balance things as well and you know if you say yes to one thing you have to say no to another thing so you really have to be committed uh, to it then so uh thankfully now uh Karina is stuck by me and the uh, uh, we've, we've managed that through time as well so yeah do it if you're interested in it and uh, committed to it and the rewards will be uh, afterwards that would be my kind of <laughs> two cents in that funny when you said that patrick because i remember having exactly the same feeling and conversation it was i didn't have to do this i brought this on myself yeah. um, but that was in relation to i suppose formal courses and i suppose the really important thing as well about cpd is there's so much of it as well that are things maybe that you might be doing anyway so the hall referred to one so there's visits to schools there's mentoring there's attending conferences attending courses presenting things that you would be doing as part of of your job anyway so um particularly in engineers ireland like, there's a very broad definition of cpd and, and all of us actually when you, when you sat down as i did actually at the weekend uh to log your your 35 hours i found actually and, and most people are the same you have more than enough um you know to, to log those those 35 hours uh, it's not all kind of formal courses or, or studying for a master's every year or anything like that. There's huge scope there. Uh, and most companies as well are also really keen, particularly those that are CPD partners of Engineers Ireland, are really keen to make sure that their people continue to develop. Um, so you'll find actually that you'll have more than enough, I, I'd say, in order to cover your 35 hours. So. I think it's stuff that you'll be doing naturally as part of your role and I don't think you'll find it a, a load or drag at all. It's, it's, it's very natural and, and easy to fit in. Yeah, and actually just on the back of COVID and things like that, there's so many of them online now as well that it, it makes it so much easier, like you don't have to be travelling up to Clyde Road to do them. Um, so 
like it has made it so accessible and uh, as I said like a lot of them are recorded as well so if you're not there on that seven o'clock on a Wednesday evening you can watch them again afterwards as well so um yeah so it's there and it's a, a accessible and those like yeah, a couple of those one hour lectures and stuff they, they all add up um to hit your 35 hours um for the end of the year as well I'm delighted to say there's a CPDR going for this evening, so why not start <laughs> with today? Um, uh, okay, so there's uh, two participants who've kind of given a little bit of an outline and they're kind of asking um, for more uh, kind of tailored advice. So I might just uh, give both of them at once. Uh, so one is due to graduate with a master's in land and hydrographic surveying in November. Are there many upcoming developments with a focus in renewable energy in Ireland on offshore to keep an eye on in the coming months and year? And keeping that in your mind, the other question is around, um, as someone with a master's in energy management, um, with a little work and experience in the industry, what further courses and certs would you advise one can look into considering the diversity and intensity of the current labour market? Um, so sorry to kind of tie those two together, but I just want to make sure we get to them all before the end of the webinar. So uh, first of all, I can see people are using some of the advice already because I'm getting little darts in my wrist here from my watch telling me people are looking to connect on LinkedIn. <laughs> so, so, uh, so well done for that. Um, just on offshore, there's massive interest in, in offshore. We have one offshore wind farm in uh, Ireland at the moment, which is an SSE wind farm off our club banks. But particularly down the East Coast, there's a huge amount um, planned. It's just that probably take maybe, you know, five to 10 years to, to develop. It's certainly something that every company that's involved is, is keen to do as soon as possible. And then there's a lot of opportunity as well on the West Coast. Uh, and the thing I suppose that people need to be aware of, I'm sure they are, is, is you needn't worry about it being five or 10 years before they're there from the point of view of jobs, because it's going to take the five or 10 years for the people working on them to make them a reality. And that's where all the engineering and energy jobs are. Um, so I, I would say that, the, you know, there's definitely a, a very fertile market uh, certainly about to come up. And, and I know in my own company, huge discussions around offshore, both east and west coast, east to start with, but coming up in, in due course in the the west coast as well and also off the coast of, of uh, gb in scotland they have a huge ambition uh, around i know it was at 40 gigawatts or something was announced during the week there by by boris johnson so i'd say lots and lots of opportunities both in ireland but not too far away as well in gb on the energy management one i, I think i could patrick might have a different take on this but i'd go back again to that energy retrofit uh, particularly with um, the Green Party minister, we have Minister Ryan is so keen to make sure that we now tackle, just if, if people, I don't know if they're aware, if you look at the emissions profile for Ireland, about 33% of it is agriculture, so we're going to leave that to the agriculture minister. 20% is energy and that's where we work in, in reducing that and actually the, the uh, intensity, the carbon intensity now of electricity is half what it was about 30 years ago and now we need to bring it the other 30 in the, in, sorry, in the next 30 years to tackle the other half. But there's another 20% in transport and another 20% in heat. So we really need to work on those as well. So uh, just to go back, I suppose, to the question, I think that whole area of bare certification, retrofits, renewable heating, uh, ground source heat pumps, and um, you know, even being able to design uh, heating systems, community heating, district heating, all of that, I'd say there'll be huge advantages and opportunities in that area in the coming years. Yeah, no, I think uh, definitely on, on the first point there on the offshore, like there's huge opportunities. Like if we should hopefully have around five gigawatts of offshore wind developed by 2030. If you think currently there's four gigawatts of onshore wind, give or take, and it took us 20 odd years to get up to, up to that far, and we have to build out the same amount offshore. Um, there's going to be huge opportunities there. This I showed you a scale of some of the offshore floating turbines, like with the people relative to it like they're just off the scales I'd, I'd love to actually see them in, in person my, myself so i think there's going to be huge opportunities but there's you can see a lot of it going through the legislation there the the marine planning directive is which is the first part that has to be cleared um there's how the, the, the grid how it connects to the grid that's another um element to it the foreshore licenses as well so i think that person there with the with that qualification and the hydrology element of it um that there's going to be loads of opportunities and like I, from Cork and I suppose we all, have, everyone knows Cork, you have a bit of a chip on their shoulder, but you can see there's huge other follow on businesses coming out in the, in the Cork Harbour as well, like in terms of the operation and maintenance of these products or the, of the offshore fleet. 
um, you know, hydrogen opportunities. So there's loads of follow-on opportunities from that offshore element. So um, I, I think if you have those skill set and you're interested, you're in a great position. Uh, and on the energy management side of things, as I said, I'm looking to set up a, a sustainable community in my in my hometown as well because, um, you know, in, in the Climate Action Directive, where like the spend is something like going to be 32 billion, they want to retrofit like a half a million houses. Like what you really want, I think that's a really nice story because we really want to try and um, help. I think the most vulnerable in society, you know. Um, you know, we've seen how our health is so important during COVID times. And if you can have a, a clean house and clean fuels in your house, um, if that can help the most vulnerable in society, I think that's a, a huge opportunity. So if you have those skill sets in terms of, as Marguerite said there, but the, the commercial analysts, you know, you have that technical skill set about how to, how to do it and the commercial element on how to finance it and execute it. I think uh, that's a, they're kind of two great elements to have. So, um, Maybe things that, I, from my own personal perspective, that I think are, are are very interesting. Brilliant, thank you so so much. And uh, what I've done is I've also flagged in the chat that I think this is going to be the last question that we have time for. Um, so as we ask the question, um, yeah, actually I'll just go for it. Um, while I'm still in college with another year left, is there anything else I could do outside my course that um, would be a benefit for when I graduate and begin looking for a job in the industry? So, um, I, again, I suppose that that bit of, of, of talking to as many people as possible because it's not always the, the job you want isn't always the job you think you want and and you learn a lot more about um yourself and, and your personality as 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 you um and your interests I, I think as you go through the initial years of your career actually you never stop learning uh, so so certainly finding out as much as possible attending um webinars like this finding out um about jobs uh, I think is, is really important getting to speak to people who can tell you about the, the, the real life um, experience of the, the job that they're working in. And not every job is for every person. You know, it's, it's OK to say, actually, you know, I'm delighted you're happy doing what you're doing, but that doesn't sound like it interests me at all. Um, back again to, to, you know, Engineers Ireland and using those networks. Um, I think there's something as well, actually, in giving back. It's probably difficult while you're trying to concentrate on, on your exams. But, you know, you'll find out as well by engaging with maybe younger students and, and giving them the benefit of your expertise, whether you are somebody who's suited to that mentoring role in future. So there's, there's you know, I found no matter what role you take on, no matter what external interest you have, all of those things intersect a little bit eventually. Um, and you, you, you find that something leads to something else. And, and sometimes the quickest way from A to B is via C. Uh, in a way that you didn't see the whole thing linking up. Uh, so all that making connections all the time is really important. Yeah, like um, I think for that person, like if they're interested in a specific er area and if they want to do it in their extracurricular activity, I'd encourage them to do it. But uh, there wouldn't be one thing that I could recommend because I'd kind of, I'd say follow your nose and you what you what you're interested in and if you're passionate about it. If you ever come into an interview, that will come across in spades like um i do remember like interviewing a, a data analyst one time and they had their own website developed that they did it because they're just passionate about it and they're interested and we spend the majority of the time talking about that because you knew that that person then was going to be interested in the role and and be really in, engaged in it so uh there's like there wouldn't be one thing that i'd recommend but i would just say to the person just show your passion show your interest and uh i think you, you should be fine there like i gave examples of blogs and podcasts like I don't do any of those things but like I I'm interested in my community um I want to kind of make it a help us like um bring that kind of that climate change down to the local level um and that's something that I'm doing but I I do only do it because I'm interested in it and I'm interested in the industry um but it's up to that other person to to do what they what they find compelling really to, to get out of jail answer but that's that is the best advice just one other aspect to that, very many, including ourselves now, interview processes going into companies ask you for examples of things that you've done in the past. So it's worth actually maybe keeping a log of, like Patrick said, kind of things that you've been interested in, things you've done, and to keep a log of those examples so that you, you have them at the ready then when you need them, and, and rather than trying to do it all the night before an interview. Yeah. 
if I ever get a chance to get signed up by Jorgen Klopp, I'd be <laughs> signed up for Liverpool, like, you know, so that's my other interest as well, like, or, or Cork J. It, it might be a bit late for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they need all the help they can get from Cork at the moment. Um, well, I just want to say uh, thank you both so much. It's been uh, such a real honour to have uh, both our immediate past president and uh, CNG of the Year finalist uh, for 2020 on the call, kind of so generously giving their time to um, these energy engineering kind of graduates or final years. Um, it's been really great. Um, I always say at the end, um, if I always pass over, if you have any kind of final comments, kind of closing remarks, and to give my own is that. Um, uh, recessions will come and go but a career in energy engineering is forever so I just think there's real opportunities out there it's very tough at the moment uh, but hang in there everyone um, it's 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 not about you like there's a wider things at play and something will come your way so thank you both so much and if either of you want to go with a closing comment I'd be delighted to have it. I suppose just to say that you know I, I know things are tough we don't know what's going to happen next year as we come out of the pandemic and some of those support um, payments stop but I think definitely the energy industry has stood up better than some others so you know you're, you're in a good space we're heading towards a good space so I, I think you know we, we haven't suffered as much so far and we'll probably recover faster uh, and just the, the last thing to say first of all to, to thank yourself Michal and, and to thank Patrick for giving me this time I, I got off easy this evening I just had to turn up he had to do a lot of preparation uh, so uh, to, to thank Patrick for that as well but just to say look like I said um, I have quite an unusual name so I'm easy enough to find on, on LinkedIn so if anybody does have questions that strike you over time you didn't get a chance this evening I'm very happy to engage that way as well yeah no yeah and then I'd say to say like uh, thanks you know for the opportunity to, to talk with this um, um, I'd be like Marguerite as well I think the energy is, sector has huge opportunities there's huge change going on as I said like between the electrification of heat and transport so with that change comes opportunity so uh, I'm sure once I know it's very difficult for the, the, the guys listening tonight who are just graduating, but uh, once those opportunities come out, um, I think we, the, their qualifications will be a great um, asset to them. Like the Economist had like a really, I, I was trying to encourage everyone in our business to get a copy of it, but I don't think they, getting a copy of the Economist was floating everybody's boat, but they gave the idea of the, the petrol state versus the electoral state and how things are changing in that regard. and. Uh, the kind of knock-on ramifications for that as well and, and when I kind of read that I was like yeah, that's going to create a huge opportunity so I have uh, strong faith in, in the in the industry and I hope that uh, everyone else listening has a, has a great career in it going forward as well. Absolutely. Brilliant well thank you everyone um, 